they celebrated it. Passover was a week-long celebration, and here we know that Jesus died during the Passover time. And so, according to the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17 and 18, the Bible says in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with word, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, real quick, what Paul is saying there, part of a pastor's job is to baptize, is to counsel, is to pray, is to teach, but the main job of the man of God, of the pastor, is to give you the message of the gospel, to talk about what thus saith the Lord, in order for you and I to get right with him, to be right with him, and to have eternal salvation. And when he says that at the end of this verse right here, he says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What that means is that if we make so much out of everything else, we take the power out of the gospel message of the cross. Therefore, he says in verse number 18, for the preaching or the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. That is 100% absolute truth. That the power that you have in your life and the power that I have in my life flows through and by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. May we bow our heads in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we want to take an opportunity once again to say thank you for this day and thank you for all your blessings. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ who died on an old worthy cross so many years ago, shed his holy, royal, precious blood so that we could be redeemed, washed whiter than snow. We thank you, Lord, that he died, but Lord, we are so thankful that on that third morning, he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And God, this morning, we just want to lift our voices, lift our hands to heaven and say thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all that you've given. And thank you for all that you've taken away. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to go back to the Old Testament for just a moment. Um, there's a story in the book of Genesis chapter 22. I know you know this story very well. I've preached from it several times myself. But you've heard this story about the event where after Isaac had grown up to be probably most people believe 18, 19, possibly even 20 years old of age at this point in time, God comes in verse number 1 to Abraham and he calls out to Abraham and Abraham here, he says, here I am. And God says, now Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and I want you to take him into a place that I will show thee, and I want you to sacrifice him. And the Bible tells us in the third verse, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. Now, Abraham didn't do like what we would have done. Because most of us would have said, but Lord, why do you want, we would have questioned God. We would have went before God with all of our concerns and all of our questions, and some people would have actually said, I ain't going to do it. But the Bible says Abraham believed God and he had faith in God. So Abraham, the Bible says, got up early the next morning. He gets his servants, he gets his son, he gets all the materials that's needed to do the sacrifice. He loads them on his donkey and off they go. And for three days they're journeying. And during that time, I'm telling you, in Abraham's mind, Isaac was dead. Because God had told him to sacrifice him. So to Abraham... Isaac was as good as a dead man walking. And the Bible says when they get to the place where they, they saw far off, and they said, the verse 4 says it's on the third day that Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Now when he sees the place far off, Abraham tells his servants, he said, that y'all stay here while me and the lad go yonder and worship. And then he says, and we will come again to you. That's faith, folks. So they go up Mount Moriah, and after they're going up, the Bible tells us that he lays the wood, which is a symbol or a picture of the cross of Christ, he lays the wood on the back of Isaac. So Isaac is walking up, not realizing at this particular time that Isaac was going to be the sacrifice. He's walking up this mountain with the wood on his back. What's that remind you of? 
you, Jesus, when they put the cross upon his back and he walked up Mount Calvary carrying his own cross because he was going to be the sacrifice. Well, that's exactly what Isaac's doing. He's walking up the mountain, going to be the sacrifice. So then he looks and he goes, you know, Father, he said, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where's the sacrifice? You know, I mean, Isaac, at this point, doesn't realize exactly what's happening, so he wants to know where is the sacrifice. Abraham says in verse number 8, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Do you understand what Moses, or what Moses, well, Moses might have said it too, but do you understand what Abraham's saying here? He's saying God will provide himself a sacrifice. That's exactly what he did at Calvary. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. He said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, for I and the Father are one. So what God did, he did sacrifice himself. He did die in our place. So what, what Abraham said there was 100% true. So they get to the place. He builds the altar. He lays the wood upon the altar. He binds up Isaac and puts Isaac on the wood. He grabs the knife to sacrifice his son. And the Bible says as he lifted up his hand, getting ready to come down with that knife, that the Lord calls out an angel of the Lord, which is, I believe with all my heart, the Lord Jesus Christ himself incarnate. Jesus Christ cries out. He says, Abraham. And Abraham says, oh, here, yeah, here am I. He says, harm not the lad. Don't lay a hand on the lad. He said, for now I know that you love God and I know that you are faithful. And he said, therefore, Abraham turned around. There was a ram caught in the thicket. Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Now, here's really what I want you to see in this. Isaac is a picture and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He carried his own wood, walked up the mountain to be sacrificed. He willingly. Because you got to remember, Abraham's over 100 years old at this age. Isaac is about maybe 18, 20 years old. He's probably a lot stronger than his daddy. And he could have very easily said, I don't think so, Dad. But he did. He willingly laid down on the altar as Abraham bound him up and laid him on that. And he didn't fight according to the Word of God. But here's what's really important. When you go to uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, the Hall of Faith is the we call it a lot of times. When it talks about Abraham, the Bible tells us according to the word of God in Hebrews, um, let's see, where's it at? Hebrews, it's in Hebrews. I don't know where it's at. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. The Bible refers to Isaac as the only begotten son. Can anybody tell me in the word of God who else, one other person in all the Word of God is known as the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when you read this story in the book of Genesis, it is nothing but a picture of Jesus Christ walking up Mount Calvary to die for you and me. Now here's what's so amazing about it. When you look at the mountain range, where this Mount Moriah is, it's in the exact same mountain range, and even some people think it's extremely close to where Mount Calvary was. Not a coincidence. Then when you go on through the Bible and you go to the book of Exodus over in chapter 12, when you get to Exodus chapter 12, by now God has done nine different plagues in the place of Egypt to get Pharaoh's attention to let the people go. And you know the story Abraham, uh, uh, I got Abraham. Y'all get with me. Come on now. I'll get it right in a minute. But Pharaoh kept saying, no, no. Well, you can go a little ways and pray, but you come back. You can't take this and you can't take that. Well, then in chapter number 12, God comes to Moses and he says, this is it. This is the final plague. This plague will break Pharaoh and it will break all of Egypt and they will let you go. The plague was, that at midnight, the death angel was going to come. And when the death angel came, it was going to kill the firstborn of every family and the firstborn of every animal in the land of Egypt. So God gives a way out. He got it, and that's what God does. He always gives us a provision, an escape route. The escape route was this. He tells him and he gives explicit instructions in the first few chapters of, of first few verses of chapter 12. What it is, folks, 
because I'm so excited. I'm trying to preach, and I'm, my mouth's going ten times faster than my brain is, or my brain's going ten times faster than my mouth. I ain't sure which it is. But anyway, in the first few verses of chapter number 12, the Bible explains how they are to make it through. He says you're to take, and I've got to read this because I've, I've read it before, but this is good. In verse number 3, he says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Now, circle it, underline it, highlight it. He says, a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So in this verse, in verse number three, is just a lamb. That's what it was like before you knew Christ. He was just a lamb, a savior, a righteous man. That's all he was. Then when you get to the next verse, verse 4, and if the household be too little for the lamb, there's a transition taking place. He says, if it be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall take your count for the lamb. But in the next verse, there is a huge transition. He says, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. In the word of God, in the New Testament, it talks about the sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats is the saved and the lost, the righteous, the unrighteous, the holy, the unholy. So what it's saying here is that you're to take a male lamb. It's got to be a young lamb. He take up, and Jesus, when he died on the cross, even though People say, well, he was 33 years old. That's considered young. Most of us in here think that's really, I mean, how many of y'all wouldn't mind being 33 years old again? Some of these youngers are saying, that's old, but we all know it's young. Emma was talking the other day about somebody, and she said, well, they're old. They're about our age. And I said, thanks, Emma. And she's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but when, when you study this, it tells you it's got to be a male, got to be a young. And says, it's got to be without spot and without blemish. And it comes from out from among the people, the sheep and the goats. That's where Jesus came from. He came from an ordinary family. He came from a really poor family. And he was born. And Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God. When John's baptized in the River Jordan, he sees Jesus coming. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So here's two pictures in the Old Testament that reference Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. Now in that story in Exodus chapter 12, they were to take the blood of the lamb, put it into a basin. And in that basin, they were to go out and get a, a, a hyssop branch and take the hyssop branch, dip it in the blood. And they were put it on the doorpost and on the lintel, the doorpost of the home and on the lintel above the door was where the blood was supposed to go. And the Bible said, when the dead angel come by, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Well, folks, let me tell you something. It hasn't changed since that day. If you have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to your heart and to your life, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, His blood will redeem us. His, it sets us free. It washes our sins away. It makes us whole in the sight of God because of what took place there. Notice how the lamb was killed. After the lamb was killed, the Bible said that they were to roast the lamb with fire. He said, don't boil it. Don't eat it raw. You roast it with fire. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, he came under the fire of God. God's holy fire came down upon that altar that with Jesus Christ hung on that old rugged cross when he died for you and me. And we're studying Passover and the cross of Christ because they go together just like that. And when we read in 1 Corinthians where he says the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What kind of power do we get from the cross? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. I want to show you a few things. We're going to go to just a couple different places, three different places in the scriptures. I want to ask you to flip over just to the right of Corinthians to the book of Galatians and go to the sixth chapter of the book of Galatians. What does the power of the cross give us? First of all, I see that the power of the cross gives us
gives us the right to glory. Look at verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save, or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. What we see today is people glorifying in anything and everything except for Jesus Christ and his cross. People glorify in their houses, in their cars. They glorify in their clothes. They glorify in their accomplishments in this world. They go through life and they build their self up and they think, look at me, look at me, look what I've accomplished. Folk, can I give you another example of something? You can do nothing without Jesus Christ. You are nothing without Jesus Christ. Even the Bible tells us, Jesus said himself, but without me, you can do nothing. You couldn't even get up in the morning. You couldn't breathe the air in the morning. You couldn't eat or do anything. You couldn't even think without Jesus Christ. And so everything that you have, everything you've accomplished, everything that you've obtained is by and through the power of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you get to heaven, it'll be by and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross or you ain't going to go. So he says, I shouldn't glory in anything but Jesus, 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 and that cross where he died for you and for me. I was watching this preacher uh, last week on the internet. He was talking about the death of Christ. And he sat there and he said, I don't think we get it. He said, do you really understand the son of the living God died just for you? He died so you wouldn't have to. He took your sin and your shame and he nailed them to an old rugged cross and he said, I don't believe many people understand Jesus Christ died physically, literally died for us. He said, we just look at it as if he just passed out or something and then he woke up three days later and he said, I'm telling you, Jesus died and in that gives us the right to glory in the cross. We ought to be excited. You know, there's a lot of churches nationwide that don't even preach the cross no more because they think it might offend somebody. They've taken the crosses down in their sanctuaries. They're taking the crosses down off their steeples because the cross signifies pain and agony and bloodshed, and they don't want to offend anybody. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you something. If it offends you for me to preach about the cross, good. It ought to offend you. Because your sin and my sin is what put Jesus on that cross. If we were not sinners, if man wasn't a sinner, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. But he had to die because the blood had to be shed for those who were guilty, and that's you and me. And so I can glorify in that. The power of the cross gives me the right to glory. Galatians 6.14. Then flip over just a little bit, one page or so, to the book of Ephesians. When you get to the book of Ephesians, the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that the power of the cross gives us righteous peace. Read with me verses 11 through 14. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. I got that underlined in my Bible. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now, and I got that underlined, but now, but now, Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Let me ask you a question. Where did Christ shed his blood? On an old rugged cross. And because of that old, old rugged cross, I'm telling you, it gives us righteous peace. Peace, peace. God's peace. That peace that passes all understanding. That peace that when things go wrong, when problems come, when heartache come, you still have an inward peace down inside even though we struggle going through hard times, we struggle when you lose somebody that's close to you, a mom, a dad, grandparents, or friends, 
When you lose them, it hurts. And yes, we shed tears and yes, we cry. But there is still a peace within our heart to know that we know that we know that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, that we can be saved through him and his blood washes away. That gives us peace. That's why when things are falling apart in this world the way they're falling apart, I still got peace, Ricky. I ain't worried about it. God's in control. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my friend. He died for me. He saved me. He redeemed me. He bought me, and he's taking care of me. I've got no problem because I know God's got it all in control. That gives me peace that passes all understanding. That's why some people look at you when you're going through times and go, I don't understand how you can hold it all together. I don't understand how you're not upset about this. I don't understand why you're like you are. It's because of Jesus. Jesus gives us that peace. Jesus gives us that freedom to know that we're saved and on our way to heaven. And no matter what this world does to us, we're going to heaven forever to spend eternity with Christ. So the power of the cross gives us the right to glory. The power of the cross gives us righteous peace. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, right where we are, verse 16, 18 through 19, gives us, the power of the cross gives us reconciliation. Now before I preach this, I want you to listen. The word there is reconciled. It says in verse number 16, and he, and, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. That word enmity means the reason for opposition. It's what keeps us from being right with God. Then he says down here in verse number 18, for through him we have, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So when we read that, the Bible is telling us that word reconcile means to completely fix what is broken. So what was broken? Look at verse number 12. I read it a moment ago, but verse number 12 says that it that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That's the problem. That's what we were broken about. We were broken because we were lost and none died on our way to a devil's hell, and sometimes we didn't even know it. We, I mean, I got a good friend of mine. Spent many years with him in the Navy. His name's Bill Jones. Put him on your prayer list. He is one of the best guys you've ever met. The literal the words, he would give you the shirt off his back, he would, and he did for me one time. There was once when, when we were playing softball, and I slid into home plate, and when I slid into home plate, my shirt got caught, and it ripped my shirt. Jonesy was playing on the next team. He took his shirt off his back and gave it to me so I could continue playing. Because in the Navy, you can't play without a shirt. It ain't shirts and skins and so on. So he literally did that. He was raised Catholic. And his belief is this. If my good outweighs my bad, I'll go to heaven. That's the way he was raised. And I, through the years, have tried to communicate to him what the Bible says. The other day I sent him a message. I said, I hope you and Sue are doing good. I hope you had a good weekend. Love you, buddy. He sends back and he goes, Wes, I'm living the dream. And I thought, are you really? But see, what he's living is he's living the worldly dream. He's got it right. He retired from the military, the lieutenant commander, has a good income from that, has health care to take care of himself. And he's working another job, an electric boat, the place where they actually build the submarine. And he's a supervisor there, so he's making big money there. He's got two big old houses, one in New, uh, one in Gales Ferry and one over here in Mystic. He's got it made as far as the world sees. But the fact of the matter is, he's without Christ. He has no hope, and he's lost in this old world, and he doesn't even know it. So pray for him. I pray for him most every day. When I pray, I say, Lord, please save Bill. Because he's a great guy. You know, we don't see nobody go to hell, but definitely don't want to see.
seen nobody go to hell that's as good as he is. But what the problem was broken with you and me is we at one time were lost without Jesus Christ. We were on our way to hell. But when Jesus died on an old rugged cross, he saved us from our sins. And if we will bow at the cross, and the problem is, there's a verse in the Bible that says, and they stood by the cross. And that's the problem. There's a lot of Christians or a lot of church-going people today that are standing by the cross, but they've never knelt at the cross. In other words, they see what's going on, they hear what's going on, and they get an intellectual understanding of what's going on, but they've never seen the need in their life to bow down at an old rugged cross and ask Jesus to save them. But when you do that, according to the Bible, he reconciles us. He fixes what is broken, and it means to completely fix. Not just partly or halfway. He completely fixes what is broken, brings us in to, to him, and we are heirs to the throne of the living God. So the power of the cross gives us the right to glory, gives us righteous peace, gives us re reconciliation. But lastly, flip over just a little bit more. Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians to the book of Colossians chapter 1. The power of the cross gives us a right standing before God. Now, do you remember when Moses wanted to see God? Moses said, God, I want to see you. He had talked to God. He would listened to God. He had heard all of God's words. Saw the finger of God writing on the tablets, the Ten Commandments. So Moses had been all around God, but he hadn't seen God. And Moses says, God, I just want to see you. And God says, no man can see my face and live. Why is that? Because the Bible says that God cannot, sin cannot enter into the presence of God. And everyone in this room, every one of us, are sinners. We've all broke God's laws. We've all broke God's commandments. So that makes us sinners. So you and I, in our present state, cannot enter into the presence of God. So Moses says, okay, so God says, here's what I'll do, Moses. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, which, of course, the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to put my hand over your face. And as I walk by, I'll remove my hand and you can see my hundred parts. You can see my glory is what he tells him. And so God walks by, removes his hand, and Moses sees the glory of God. And when Moses sees the glory of God, the Bible says his face shone. I know that we should say shine, but the Bible says shone. His face shone. It lit up. It glowed from the glory of God. So you and I are sinners. If we bow at the cross of Christ and ask for forgiveness of our sins and we ask Jesus to save us, ask him to forgive us of our sins, according to the word of God, when we believe on him and trust in him and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins completely. And so what happens, we are made right in the sight of God. But guess what? We get up, we go outside, and what do we do? We sin again. We go to bed. We have our prayers. We ask God to forgive us. We get up the next day. What do we do? We sin again. But do you understand this? That when the rapture takes place, whether you're in a grave over there or whether you're alive walking around, you're going to be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, this old dead flesh is going to drop. And I'm going to be robed in a brand new robe of flesh. And I'm going to enter into his presence. And listen to what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile, there's that word again, all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Flip over to chapter 2, look at verse 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, which means made alive, together with him having forgive you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that is against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the 
away, nailing it to his cross. Do you realize and do you understand that when the roll is called up yonder, that you are going to be robed in a coat of righteousness. And when you and I stand in the very presence of the Lord God Almighty on his throne, when we stand there, we'll stand there 100% holy, unblameable, sinless, because of what Christ did on an old rugged cross. That is the power of the cross. I don't know about you, but that thrills me. Because if I had to go on my own, Tommy, I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't even make it, we sung about the Eastern Gate, I wouldn't make it to the gate, let alone inside the gate. But because of what Jesus Christ did on an old rugged cross a little over 2,000 years ago, I am redeemed, washed whiter than snow. I may not look like it here, and you may not think much of it, but I am an heir to the kingdom of God Almighty. I'm a royal descendant. I'm saved from time and eternity. That's good news. If Leonard wasn't here, I'd take credit for this, but Leonard's here, so I can't take credit for this. Because he heard it yesterday, too. Brother Danny Dodds gave a very, very interesting point yesterday. And I'm going to try to give it to you the way he gave it to you, to the best of my ability, because I do not have a photographic memory or a listening memory. But here's what he said. He said many people in the church have what is called an intellectual knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, if I asked you, how many of y'all know about Jesus? Everybody raise your hand. Do y'all know that he was born of a virgin? Yes. Do you know he lived a sinless life? Absolutely. Do you know that he died on a cross for your sins and shed his blood so you could be redeemed? Yes, preacher, we know that. Do you know that Jesus Christ, the morning of the first day of the week, that he got up victorious over death, hell, and the grave, he ascended up to heaven where he sits to the right hand of God the Father, and he's coming back for us one of these days? Do y'all know that? Yes. That's called an intellectual knowledge. You've learned that through the years. If you've been in church, you've been in Sunday school, you've been to revival, you've been in, in a worship, you've heard that, you know that. It's intellectual knowledge. But he said what the deal is, is so many people in the church have such an intellectual knowledge, they have forgotten that you need an experiential knowledge. You've got to experience Christ. It's like this. When you hear a song that speaks to your heart about what God's done for you, and that spirit starts turning on the inside, and it squeezes your heart to where your eyes begin to leak, and you go, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. That's a pretty good sign you've got an experiential knowledge. It means you've experienced Christ. But if you're in a service and everything starts getting good and everybody seems to be happy but you, have you ever thought, what's wrong with me? Maybe, just maybe, you have an intellectual knowledge. Because if I asked how many of y'all know Jesus, we'd all say, yes, I know him. And that's important. But you know what the most important thing is? Does Jesus know you? Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, In that day many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wondrous works. Sounds like church people to me, don't it to you? Do you remember what Jesus says? I think it's in verse 23. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. See, those people that stood before Jesus at that point when Jesus is talking, they know him. Because they called him Lord. We prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name. We did a lot for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. So folks, for you to say, I know Jesus, yeah, that's a good thing. But the most important thing is, do, does Jesus know you? Because if all you have is a head knowledge, which I believe everybody in this room has a head knowledge, but do you have a heart knowledge? Do you know that you're saved because he lives inside of you? And I know I've 
I've said this before, but people say, well, how do you know God lives inside you? Because there's no way anybody as big and as mighty and as powerful as God can live inside you and you not know about it. So if you're in this room today and you say, well, preacher, I'm not sure. I know you got an intellectual knowledge, but do you have that experiential knowledge? Have you experienced Christ? Because I tell you, when you read a story like this, what, what we studied today, when you read from Genesis 22 and Exodus 12, and you come to 1 Corinthians 15, and Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians, all it talks about is what Jesus did for us on the cross. The benefits of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Have you taken those benefits and received them unto yourself so that you know that you know that you know that you're saved and born again? Would you please stand your feet?